Yeah, if I see the participants coming in. Mm -hmm. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. I'm Lisa from the library, and today I have David Carr with me at once again to do an ethics presentation on terminating representation of problem clients. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping items to talk about. One is that we will be issuing CLE certificates today to those of you verified to have, atten have attended and shown up in Zoom. And I'll be sending those out by email this afternoon. So look for that in your email. Another thing I wanted to mention is that this is an interactive presentation. Hopefully there will be some time toward the end for David to get to some of your questions. If you do have questions, we ask that you use the Q&A function here in Zoom to post those. You'll see a Q&A icon on your screen with two speech bubbles, and that is what, where you can click and type in your questions. And you can do that either with your name or anonymously. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that there will be a link to a survey at the end of the program. We always appreciate if any of you take a minute or two to fill that out for us. We like getting feedback from you. And so I think just about everybody is here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to David. Okay, thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you to uh, all of you folks out there in cyberspace. I appreciate your time. And I, I hope we can have a, an interesting discussion uh, over the next hour about um, withdrawing from representation of problem clients. Um, when I decide on CLE topics, I often, it's sort of what the issue du jour is in, in my world. Uh, as Simon and Garfunkel, quoting Ecclesiastes, said, the, there's a time, a season uh, for everything. And the last couple of months for me have been the season of uh, assisting lawyers who want to withdraw in cases involving problem clients. So uh, I don't know, it seems like uh, the themes from time to time repeat themselves. So I'm going to go through, we're going to talk about the basic uh, rules regarding withdrawal, uh, lawyer withdrawal from problem clients. And problem clients, yeah, you know, could be defined in different ways. And I think when we go through the, bear, the, the actual rules, you, you'll kind of see how those problem clients shake out in terms of, of what the problem is. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me a moment. The PowerPoint is queued up. So uh, I've called this the long goodbye. It doesn't necessarily have to be a long goodbye, but there are a number of steps that a lawyer needs to take in order to uh, ethically withdraw from representation. And uh, sometimes that process can be protracted. Um, Lawyers are sometimes surprised to learn that they just can't withdraw at will from representation, either in a litigation matter or a transaction matter, but that there is an actual rule that governs the circumstances under which they may withdraw. And those, that rule is fairly liberal, um, but uh, you can't, well, I've seen in, in fee agreements, I've seen lawyers in the fee agreement, they, they purport to have the client agree that the lawyer can withdraw at any time uh, on notice. Notice is one of the elements of withdrawal, but it's not the only withdrawal, with, uh, the only requirement for withdrawal. The, with the rule on withdrawal, let's see if we can advance our slide here. Okay, let's try a different way. Hold on, oh, there we go. Okay, um, the, the basic rule on termination of employment is rule 1.16. And for all you lawyers out there, I realize there may be some non-lawyers, uh, maybe good for the non-lawyers as well. Rule 1.16 is, is an essential rule that you need to know because many ethical problems or ethical issues arise on termination of employment. And in some parts, in some areas, these are rules that are very fertile grounds for state bar complaints um, and, and state bar discipline. So uh, law practice is kind of like space flight or aeronautics. Um, the most problematical parts of the journey are usually the takeoff 
uh, and the landing. And most of the time, the, the in-between part uh, is fairly serene, but the beginning and end can be problematical. Rule 1.16 governs termination of employment, but when the rule was revised in 2018, uh, it also was revised to include acceptance of employment. So the same grounds for, for mandatory termination of employment are, are also grounds for refusing to accept the case. In other words, these grounds are, are reason, uh, these grounds require you to reject employment from the beginning, but they also furnish grounds for mandatory withdrawal uh, when these three conditions or four conditions are met. These are circumstances where you must withdraw from employment. Hold a second, I'm gonna move my pallet out of the way. There we go. Um, you have to withdraw when you know, and in addition, you may not accept employment, when you know that the client is bringing an action, conducting a defense, asserting a position in litigation or taking an appeal without probable cause and for the purpose of harassing or maliciously injuring any person. Uh, you can't accept that employment and you must withdraw if you discover that your client is in fact um, asserting what amounts to a frivolous claim for the purpose of harassing or maliciously injuring any person. This rule closely parallels the law of malicious prosecution. The same basic elements are present in both. A malicious prosecution, of course, is a tort which requires uh, damages. Uh, ethical rules don't require damages for the state bar to prosecute, uh, but it's very much a, a parallel in terms of circumstances where you must not accept employment or you must withdraw. Uh, a quick war story, when I was a young lawyer and uh, working for a, a law firm of uh, rather aggressive lawyers, uh, one Saturday morning when I was in the office and uh, in this law firm, you were required to be there on Saturday. Uh, the boss comes into the office, the chief partner comes in and says, I want you to draft a complaint. I want it to be long and, uh, and oppressive and I don't care what it says. So as a young lawyer, I probably uh, violated this rule uh, because like a, a dutiful minion, I drafted such a complaint for the use of our client who wanted a basically a, a cudgel to try to get out of a contract. So uh, I will confess that as a young man, I probably broke this rule. Uh, I was not disciplined for it, uh, but it did open my eyes as to the way certain lawyers practice law. If the client wants to hurt somebody but with a frivolous lawsuit or, to, or asserting a position that uh, has no uh, support and the purpose is to hurt somebody, you can't take that case. And if the, you find the lawyer, if you find the client wants to do that, you have to get out of the case. You don't have an option. Uh, the second ground is uh, a little broader. If you know or recently should know that your continued employment or continued representation of the client will result in a violation of the rules, the rules of professional conduct, or of the State Bar Act, you must withdraw. For instance, if you know, come to know, or reasonably should know, in other words, uh, a reasonable lawyer would know under those circumstances, for instance, that continued employment will result in a conflict that cannot be cured under Rule 1.7 or Rule 1.9, you must withdraw from employment. That's that's a, an example of a kind of scenario where you must withdraw. But this could implicate any of the rules of professional conduct. So if your continued representation is going to violate the rules, you got to get out of the case. This applies, of course, both in litigation and transactional work. Uh, number three, if your mental or physical condition renders it unreason unreasonably difficult to carry out the representation effectively. This dovetails with rule 1.1, the rule on competence, uh, which requires not only that you be competent 
but that you pos possess the physical uh, and mental ability to discharge the work. If your physical, if your mental or physical condition makes it unreasonably difficult to carry out the representation effectively, you can't take the case. And if you already have the case, you've got to get out of the case. I will tell you that I've never seen this cited. I've never seen this cited as a ground uh, for an attorney, um, at least in a motion to withdraw, uh, to remove themselves from a case. And there are sad situations that I've seen where lawyers in, whose men were physical condition rendered them absolutely incapable of effectively representing a client, uh, continued to represent the client in some cases because they needed to maintain their medical insurance. Uh, finally, the fourth ground of for mandatory withdrawal. If your client fires you, you got to get out of the case. As strange as it may seem, there have been instances where lawyers have been fired by their clients and, and, absolute, and refused to quit working on the case. Uh, there is uh, a case where the client, the lawyer was representing the client on appeal. The client uh, decided they didn't want to continue with the appeal. The lawyer who was so fired up with zealous righteousness over the client's situation refused to quit working on the appeal, even though the client had fired the lawyer. And that is a, a published state bar case. Uh, those are circumstances under which you much withdraw, must withdraw. And they're good to keep in mind. Uh, but they don't really come up that much. Uh, most lawyers have the good sense to withdraw when these things occur. So it's not a, a real fertile source of state bar complaints or of motions to withdraw. But it is something that needs to be kept in mind. Uh, that's 1.16a. Now, hold on a second. Let me advance the slide. The real kind of field of action, if you will, at least in my world, is 1.16b. These are situations where you may withdraw from representation. You're not required to withdraw, but you may withdraw. And this is where lawyers who are dealing with problem clients this is where the action is. Uh, some parts of 1.16b mirror 1.16a. For instance, you may withdraw from employment under 1.16b1, where the client insists on presenting a claim, a position, or a making a demand in a non-litigation matter that is not warranted and cannot be supported by good faith, argument for an extension, modification, or reversal of existing law. In other words, the client is taking an unreasonable position that can't be supported. Under those circumstances, you may withdraw from the case. Um, and if the client refuses to follow your advice, it, you probably have good grounds to tell the client that you don't want to continue to represent them. Uh, sometimes lawyers use the jargon firing a client. Uh, I had to fire a client yesterday uh, who very much fit this scenario, and I won't, I won't detail the specifics, but a client who insisted on asserting a defense in a state bar discipline matter that was simply not warranted under the law, and I chose not to represent. I chose to withdraw from the case, and I told the client why I was withdrawing. Number two, if the client intends to pursue a criminal or fraud a criminal or fraudulent course of conduct, or if the lawyer has used your services to advance a course of conduct that you have a reasonable belief constitutes a crime or a fraud, uh, sometimes you will discover after the fact that you have in fact been so used. That is a ground for permissive withdrawal. Now, it, it's interesting to me that it's not a ground for mandatory withdrawal, but only a ground for permissive withdrawal. In other words, if you discover the client uh, wants to uh, pursue uh, a, uh, a bad path, um, you don't have to withdraw. You can tell the client that's a bad idea. I'm not gonna help you with it. Uh, don't do it. Or if you discover the client has already done it, you can tell the client that, uh, you know, 
you've done a bad thing. I will, I will continue to represent you under some circumstances, but I have the option to withdraw. Those are things you can do under 1.16b2. Uh, and it actually gets a little more interesting than that when you look at 116b3. Even if the client insists that you pursue a course of conduct that is criminal or fraudulent, you're not required to withdraw from the case. Of course, you can't pursue that course of criminal or fraudulent conduct. And it's possible that if the client insists on it, you may have grounds to, for mandatory withdrawal under 1.16a1. But if the client only insists on doing it, uh, it's a matter of, of permissive withdrawal. You can withdraw or not withdraw. Of course, you can't do the bad thing. Uh, if, you, if you assist the client in a course of conduct that is criminal or fraudulent, you're going to violate rule of professional conduct 1.2. And of course, that is grounds for mandatory withdrawal. So these rules are interesting in the way they kind of work together to sometimes uh, furnish some rather fine lines between scenarios where you must withdraw and scenarios where you only may withdraw. Uh, honestly, this stuff doesn't come into play that often in the, the one through three don't come into play that often in my line of work, though I've seen instances where they've been evoked. Uh, where a lawyer is faced with a problem client and problem clients, the, the range of, of what makes a problem client could be quite, you know, quite large and it's rather ill-defined. Uh, there's a phrase from case law that talks about the fact that the lawyer-client relationship is said to be a relationship of mutual trust and confidence. And I want to emphasize the mutual part. The lawyer, of course, as a fiduciary, the client uh, has to have trust in the lawyer, but the lawyer also has to have trust in the client. Scenarios where you've discovered the client has lied to you, you've discovered the client has not provided you with important information necessary to your representation, uh, those are scenarios where the client's behavior can make it unreasonably difficult for the lawyer to carry out the representation. Scenarios where the client has been abusive, sometimes abusive to the lawyer, abusive to the staff, the lawyer's staff. Um, these are all scenarios which can make it unreasonably difficult for the lawyer to carry out the representation effectively. And um, in part of it, part of it depends on how the degree to which the client's conduct has, has essentially made the attorney-client relationship ineffective or has contributed to a breakdown. If you have a client where every phone call becomes a screaming match, you probably in a situation where the client is making it unreasonably difficult for you to represent them. Uh, that's number four, and that comes into play a lot in motions to withdraw although sometimes it's not obvious and we'll get to the reasons why soon. Uh, finally, five is a good one. Uh, the client breaches a material term of the agreement or obligation to the lawyer relating to the representation. And the lawyer has given the client reasonable warning that the lawyer will withdraw unless the client fulfills the agreement, performs the obligation. This is about getting, this is almost always about getting paid. You know, the client, you made your, you know, you have, uh, let's hope that you have a very well thought, thought out fee agreement. Um, you've done, a, you've done a certain amount of work for the client. Uh, the client knows they have to pay. The client refuses to pay. And so uh, this really mostly comes into play with the lawyer. The client's just not paying the bill. And that is a separate ground for permissive withdrawal. The mistake I see many lawyers make, and part of this is, is what's called the, a variation of what's called the sunk cost fallacy, is that a lawyer perhaps has been in, involved in the case, has done a lot of work, has built up a huge bill, client's not paying the bill. The lawyer knows that if the client withdraws from representation, the client the, the bill may never get paid. Any part of the bill may never get paid. 
So the lawyer stays in the case because the lawyer thinks that only by staying in the case will I have leverage to get my bill paid. And so many lawyers make the mistake of staying in too long after they really should have withdrawn, uh, in part because they are concerned that withdrawing will compromise their ability to get paid. So five comes into play, four and five come into play in many motions to withdraw. But B has other, other goodies in it. And uh, hold on, there we go. Six is kind of a no brainer. The client agrees to let you go. Uh, number seven, uh, and I've been in this scenario a few times, you are working with co-counsel and you can't work with co-counsel. Co-counsel and, and you just are at loggerheads and it's just not working out again. Uh, representation only works well, usually only works well where there's some degree of harmony. Uh, number eight, and this is an interesting contrast with 1.B3, or 1.83. 1.83 says, says if uh, your mental or physical condition makes it unreasonably difficult, you must withdraw. 1.16B8 says that if it is merely difficult, not necessarily unreasonably difficult to carry out the representation effectively because of your mental or physical condition, that's a ground for permissive withdrawal. And it's at, at what point on the spectrum does difficulty become unreasonable? It's not quite clear. There's not a lot of case law guidance, almost none on any parts of 1.16 except some of the parts I'm gonna to come to on your obligations uh, when you withdraw. So, but it's something to keep in mind that if your mental or physical condition makes it merely difficult, not necessarily unreasonably difficult, that could be a ground for permissive withdrawal. Um, again, 1.16B9, seems to be a little bit at odds with the grounds for mandatory withdrawal in 1.16a. It says continuing the representation is likely to result in a violation of the rules of the State Bar Act. Uh, likely versus certain, I guess, is the distinction. But again, it mirrors some of the grounds for mandatory withdrawal. And finally, there's a catch-all provision in the litigation matter. Uh, which says that the lawyer believes in good faith in a proceeding pending before a tribunal that the tribunal will find the existence of other good cause for withdrawal. The, the, the court has a lot of control over a proceeding. The court has a lot of discretion to um, kind of manage the attorney-client relationship in a sense. <coughs> to ensure that the proceeding is conducted in a just fashion where the parties have effective representation. So this is kind of a catch-all provision uh, that's seldom used, but it, it sort of encompasses situations that don't fall comfortably within the other parts of 116B, but that you in a good faith, uh, that you, but you in a good faith exercise have a belief that this justifies you getting out of a litigation matter. So those are the grounds for getting out of um, for permissive withdrawal. And it's good to know that if you're going to get out of a case, you need to try ethically get out of the case. You need to you need to have a reason that fits within this framework of 1.16a mandatory, 1.16b permissive. Okay, now we start to get we start to get to some of the other parts of 1.16 that often trigger state bar scrutiny and sometimes discipline. If you're in a litigation matter, you can't withdraw from a matter unless the court lets you out. In other words, you can't get out unless the court says it's okay. Um, 
the hypothetical situation that's troublesome is a situation where under 1.16a you have to get out your your client insists on pursuing a court of act a course of action that is has no probable cause and is asserted only to harass somebody or your physical and mental condition makes it unreasonably difficult for you to continue a says you've got to get out of the case, but C says you can only get out if the court lets you out. What, there are scenarios where a lawyer under 1.16a really must withdraw, but can't get permission of the court to get out of the case. Very rare scenarios, because as we'll see, courts are generally pretty liberal about granting motions to withdraw, but it, it is a possibility that you may be in a mandatory withdrawal scenario where you can't get the court to let you out. Uh, very rare. I'm not sure I've seen more than an instance or two where this situation occurred. It's obviously very difficult, especially in situations, for instance, where you're in the, you're in the middle of a trial uh, or other proceeding um, and situations arise in the in the course of trial that suggests withdraws mandatory uh, and you essentially uh, are, are not going to be able to get the court's permission to get out of the case. But for this reason, in a litigation matter, of course, in a in a non litigation matter, there's no court, but if you're in front of a court uh, and you want to get out, you're going to have to either file a motion or get permission of the court uh, in some other way. And there are really, at least in California, uh, under CCP 20, uh, I'm sorry, CCP 284, there are really only two ways to get out. Either consent of the client and attorney, a substitution of counsel, or an application of either the client or the attorney. Interestingly enough, the client can make a motion to fire you. Although if the client fires you, uh, presumably uh, you must withdraw under 1.16 uh, A4, you, you're gonna have to file a motion to withdraw under CCP 284. There's only two ways to get out, in an action or special proceeding. Um, the motion to withdraw is highly structured. It's been channeled into a California rule of court. And part of it is to ensure some kind of uniformity as to how the motion is done. Uh, prior to this California rule of court, uh, which was enacted uh, about 20, 25 years ago, uh, you had, many sort of variations on how the motion was was done but under crc california rule of court 31362 it can only be done one way and that is on a the judicial counsel form for a motion to withdraw uh mc051 you must make the motion on this form in california state court this is not binding, of course, in federal court litigation. And although the California Rules of Professional Conduct in every federal district court in California have been incorporated into the local rules of court. So your, your basic substantive law grounds are, are going to be the same in every federal district court, at least in California. Uh, but there's, as far as I know, there's no federal rule of civil procedure that governs, specifically governs motions to withdraw. They're made like any other motion. In California, though, it's got to be on judicial counsel forms, 051 and 052. Now, B says that notwithstanding any other rule of court, there's no memorandum is required to be filed or served with a motion to withdraw. In other words, you don't have to provide points and authorities, but you do have to provide a declaration um, 
uh, of evidentiary support, just like any other motion, you have to support this motion with evidence. And that means a declaration. And it's a form declaration, form MC052. And the rule is, fair, is specifically says that the motion must state in general terms and without compromising the confidentiality of the attorney-client relationship, why a motion is brought instead of filing a consent or a substitution of lawyers. And when they say general terms, uh, we're gonna get to an ethics opinion in a second that, that talks about how limited your radius of action really is. When you're, when you're going to tell the court why I wanna get out of the case, there's almost very little you can say describe the declaration must state in general terms and without compromising confidentiality, the reasons for withdrawal. Um, this basically means that perhaps you might be able to cite one or more of the provisions of rule 1.16a or 1.16b, uh, but, but not much more than cite to the rule. And as we will see in a second, Cite to the rule is even in some circumstances that might give away too much. Uh, but you're, you're, you know, generally these declarations are going to be extremely short uh, under 3.1362.1. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. You must serve the motion on all parties as well as the client. And 3.1362B uh, talks about the particulars of service. Uh, it's gotta be served on the client. Uh, it's gotta be served on the, at the current residence or business address or the service address is the last known residence or business address of the client. And the attorney has been unable to locate a more current address after making a reasonable attempt to do so. Um, it's, it seems to be, it's common. Well, let's put it this way. Among the attorneys that I counsel, it's not uncommon for clients to completely disappear off the face of the earth. Uh, I counsel lawyers in their fee agreements to have a provision in the fee agreement. Remember the fee agreement's about more than fees. It's also kind of the constitution of your attorney-client relationship. Uh, it, it sets forth the duties of the client as well as the duties of the lawyer. It's really a good idea to have a provision in your fee agreement that requires the client to keep you notified of their whereabouts, their current address. Uh, I have that in my fee agreement as a duty of the client, as well as the duty to pay fees. Uh, that helps to bolster a motion to withdraw because you can't locate the client. But if you're unable to locate a current address, you must make reasonable efforts to do so within 30 days before the filing of the motion to be relieved. What is a reasonable effort? Well, certainly probably consulting readily available databases. Uh, that is certainly a reasonable effort. Under some circumstances, a, a simple skip trace, uh, a skip trace is a, uh, you would hire an investigator to do a search of publicly available databases to try to locate a current uh, address for the client. Under some circumstances, that might be a reasonable step, depending on the facts. Uh, do you need to hire a private detective to try to trace your client down in Tierra del Fuego or wherever the client has gone to? Well, you probably don't need to. That's probably not a reasonable effort under most circumstances. Uh, but you've got to make some effort to locate the client if you don't have a current address. And that's got to be part of your declaration under uh, CRC 31362. And they have helpfully um, given us a definition of current address. Current means the address was confirmed within 30 days before the filing of the motion to be relieved. Merely demonstrating that the notice was sent to the client's last known address and not returned the mailbox rule is not in and of itself to demonstrate sufficient uh, notice that the address is current. Uh, part of the reason lawyers have a, a problem with disappearing clients is the lawyers themselves don't have regular communications with clients. 
Um, and this dovetails well with the communications rule. Uh, marketing people talk about touches and they say you want to have a touch, if you will, with the, with the client, with a client or a prospective client at regular intervals. Regular statements sent to the client regarding the work that's been done. Regular notices to the client regarding the status of the matter. In my early days as a lawyer, I was a collections lawyer uh, and we collected money, which was a lot of fun. I called it the treasure hunt and we had a lot of good times doing that. But we had a system of regular status reports and every client got a status report every 30 days, whether there was anything to report or not, it was a check off the box form. And one of the boxes was no new information, uh, we'll update on status in 30 days. And sometimes in the collection business, we sent on a lot of those. A simple touch that goes out to the client at regular intervals, uh, in part because you can, you can discern if that starts to come back undeliverable, you may be able to discern whether you have a problem with a disappearing client. But again, you could address that problem in your fee agreement and also by regular contact with the client. Finally, the last requirement of CRC 31362, you must specify, you must include a copy of an order um, and it must be lodged with the moving papers. All hearing dates uh, scheduled, currently scheduled must be included in the order um, and a copy of the signed order after the, the motion is granted must be served on the client and all the parties who have appeared in the action. Uh, the court can delay the effective date of the order until proof of service of a copy of a signed order on the client has been filed with the court. This is an obvious measure to avoid prejudice to the client. Uh, obviously in the disappearing client scenario, it can be difficult to avoid prejudice because the client by their own actions typically have made themselves inaccessible. But this in part, this is a safeguard to be sure the clients don't are not prejudiced by your withdrawal from the case. Of course, some prejudice is almost inevitable in withdrawal. Um, withdrawal can send a negative message to the opposition. It can tell the opposition that there's discord, disorganization uh, on the other side and, and that can be used by the opposition to their advantage. Uh, but, some, but that in many ways can't be avoided. Uh, we have to have effective attorney-client relationships. And that means that where they're not effective, the, the attorney has to have a mechanism to get out of the case. But there are safeguards. And uh, I'll get to, to the safeguards and the rules in a minute, uh, but there's a very good Good opinion from the Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct, which is the official uh, body the, uh, of the State Bar of California that writes ethics opinions. I, I can't praise these ethics opinions enough. They're available on the State Bar website and they, they address many common ethical questions. So for you practicing lawyers out there, uh, having this at your disposal and being able to find these opinions and looking at new opinions as they come out, I, I highly recommend that you do that. Um, I served on this committee for three years and I will tell you that the amount of work that goes into these opinions is, is enormous. Uh, a group of the smartest lawyers in the state of California who were kind enough to include me, though I'm not sure I'm in that group, uh, really belong there sometimes, uh, work, Poprak works tremendously hard to write these opinions. They are authoritative. And in fact, the rules of professional conduct cite them as authoritative sources for ethics. And so they're a really valuable resource to answer um, common ethical dilemmas. Poprak 2050-192 talks about the magic words. And in order to protect client confidences on withdrawal, Remember, California's got the strictest confidentiality rule in the country. Uh, it says you may only disclose to the court as much as you need 
that is as much as you need as is reasonably necessary to demonstrate a need to withdraw. And ordinarily, it will be sufficient to say only words to the effect that ethical considerations require withdrawal, or that there's been an irre irreconcilable breakdown in the attorney-client relationship. Those are the magic words, irreconcilable breakdown in the attorney-client relationship. Nothing more needs to be disclosed. Uh, when I left the State Bar in 2001 and became a State Bar defense lawyer, one of my first cases with a lawyer who had filed a motion to withdraw on a family law matter, and in the lawyer's zeal to provide the court with all the evidence it needed to grant his motion, the lawyer had provided copies of all of his billing statements with the motion to withdraw, including billing statements that considered, I mean, they were very good billing statements, very complete. Uh, but withdrawing for non-payment of fees, he felt it was necessary to provide the billing statements with the court. Uh, that case resulted in a private reproval because in the process of attaching those billing statements, my client, one of my very first clients, had actually uh, violated his duty of confidentiality. Uh, under the circumstances, we were able to negotiate a private uh, reproval which I think was a very appropriate disposition, but you can only say so much. POCRAC 2015-192 addresses the difficult situation. What if the court orders disclosure of confidences? If the court orders you to disclose confidences, COPRAC punts on this issue. Uh, you, you know the old saying, bring your toothbrush. Uh, if the court orders you to reveal confidential information, you, the committee, this is such a difficult ethical problem. The committee says we can't categorically opine on whether or not it's acceptable or not when the court orders you to. But you must take reasonable steps if you choose to disclose information to minimize the impact of that choice on the client. As a practical matter, if the court orders you to disclose confidential information, it's going to be extremely difficult for the bar to discipline you. I'm not saying that order is a complete defense, but it, it certainly, uh, under those circumstances, it would seem very unfair to discipline a lawyer. Uh, you, you sort of have a, a Hobson's choice here. Either you reveal confidential information, which violates the rule, or you can disobey an order of the court, which also violates a separate rule. So uh, some of the most interesting problems in ethics are these conflicting duty questions. Uh, what about an in-camera hearing? A case called Manfredi and Levine versus Superior Court is instructive. Here, a law firm moved to withdraw using only the magic words, but the client opposed the motion to withdraw, saying there's no breakdown in the attorney-client relationship. Uh, the trial court, I think, suspecting that the motivation was perhaps economic, this was a contingent fee case, suspecting that the lawyers perhaps wanted to get out because the case just turned out to be, frankly, a dog, denied the motion to withdraw, saying there's an insufficient basis and the appellate court upheld the trial court, stating that a factual basis for withdrawal could have been explored in an in-camera hearing. Well, COPRAC 2015-192 says, well, no, even in an in-camera hearing, you can't reveal client information. You're out of the out of earshot of the opposition, but you still have a duty to keep that information confidential. Nonetheless, asking for an in-camera hearing is a really good idea, especially if you think the client is going to oppose the motion to withdraw. Because in my experience, what happens is that in the in-camera hearing, the client will quite often open the door to the exposure of confidential information or the client themselves will expose confidential information in, in their zeal to oppose the motion to withdraw, which essentially will allow the court to rule on the motion. In some cases involving truly insane clients, uh, the fact that the, 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 the client in camera uh, actually proves to the court that the attorney-client relationship has broken down because they begin to you know, basically spout a bunch of crazy stuff. 
I've been hired by lawyers to appear at some of these in-camera hearings in those scenarios. And the motions are almost always granted because the client themselves goes in camera and proves that the attorney-client relationship is broken down. Well, yeah, the federal court dilemma. Um, the dilemma in federal court is federal judges sometimes don't think the California rules apply to them and they want to apply the more liberal ABA model rules with their more extensive uh, confidentiality provisions. So that can be a difficulty in federal court. I don't have time to dwell on this problem, uh, but I've seen this occur where a federal court feels that California rules don't apply. ABA model rules are what we apply in this court. And the answer is, well, your own local rules in every district in California says that California rules of professional conduct, California standards apply. Okay, we're getting close to the end of our time and now we're getting to what in some ways is the meat uh, and of where the state bar, the state bar generally takes action and imposes discipline. You can't terminate representation until you take reasonable steps to avoid reasonably foreseeable prejudice to the rights of the client, including sufficient notice. If you're going to get out, this is, situa this is a situation where if it's too close to a major date like a trial, if you want to withdraw on the eve of trial, there's a good chance that you're not, the court won't let you out because it's going to be unreasonably prejudicial to the client. You've got to take steps to avoid prejudice. That means you've got to delay dates. Sometimes that means you have to help the client find another lawyer. Um, it could entail any number of things that reasonable things you need to do to avoid prejudice to the client. It doesn't say you have to move heaven and earth. It only says you have to take reasonable steps to avoid reasonably foreseeable prejudice. That's 1.16D. 1.16E, this has been the source of so much angst, I can't even tell you how many stupid, if I may use that word, how many stupid state bar complaints have been based on the lawyer's failure to provide the client their file. The bar believes that the client filed, although it's defined in the rule as all items reasonably necessary to the client's representation whether the client is paid for them or not, the state bar believes that this means essentially the entire client file. And there are, there are ethics opinions that say, well, the client paid for the work, therefore the client is paid, is entitled to the entire file. If the file, if the client requests on termination their file, it is your duty to provide them with the file. And the state bar, it, you know, feet firmly planted in the last century, I believe that, that means all the original documents. And there's actually a helpful Coprac opinion that's, that fleshes that out and says reasonable, reasonable um, items reasonably necessary to the representation include electronic documents. We have moved almost exclusively to electronic documents. Uh, I essentially operate a paper practice if a piece of paper comes in, uh, that piece of paper is going to be something that gets scanned and entered into an electronic database. <coughs> but the upshot, because electronic documents are easy to produce, the upshot uh, is that now we have incredibly large electronic files and we start to run into the email problem. Email is... Um, I'm, I want to say it's a blessing and a curse, but sometimes it seems more of a curse. I had a discipline case where the where the emails exchanged between the client and the lawyer, something the state bar asked for in the course of their investigation. They generally, in a client complaint, will ask you to provide all communications. We had emails that came to 7,000 pages. I'm sure that's not even a record. 7,000 pages of email. Uh, that we had to somehow corral and provide. Many law firms don't have good systems to capture email. Outlook doesn't do a very good job. Um, there are some custom programs that do a better job. 
but frankly, many e there are many emails that may never get captured in, in a situation where the client and lawyer are emailing each other a lot. And then we get to the problem of things like text messages, which are, is, can be even more problematical. You have to provide electronic documents on withdrawal. And that includes email, that includes work product, discovery request, because the bar again believes that all of that stuff belongs to the client. And the fact that you may have provided that to the client earlier doesn't really matter to them. It's a real problem and you've gotta be, you've gotta be aware of the problem. And uh, to the extent you're maintaining electronic files, you've gotta have some system to capture email communications. That is like the single biggest headache uh, that I've seen when it comes to producing client files on termination of employment. Clients will complain to the state bar that they didn't get their old file. Often, sometimes they will do it as a tactic uh, to avoid, to, just to make a state bar complaint. Sometimes they'll, they'll have a legitimate beef. The file was not provided to them. And last, and but certainly not least, when your term when your employment terminates, you have a duty to return unearned fees. Uh, this provision, of course, is not applicable to a true retainer paid solely for ensuring availability. You can earn your fees two ways, either by providing services or by pro providing availability. Uh, the problem is most lawyers almost exclusively provide services and not just availability. The true retainer is a hangover from an earlier age when, strange, strange to think this, see this now, at one point we didn't have enough lawyers to serve people. Uh, now it seems like they're super, you know, super abundant. Uh, you had to pay for a place in line essentially, and that's the true retainer. The problem child of the law, a true retainer under rule 1.5D is something you can you can't you you can no longer use the word non-refundable earned on receipt because every fee has to be earned uh, except the true retainer and even that has to be earned by availability. You have to prove that you made yourself available uh, to the client during a specified period of time on a specified matter. Availability, not services. Uh, the true retainer in a case called Brockway. Um, hold on a second. I lost the share screen there for a second. I don't know why. Uh, the true retainer is highly disfavored because it's been used as a subterfuge to, to charge a fee that, a, a non-refundable fee. There is no such thing as a non-refundable fee. Even a true retainer must be earned by providing availability. So the, if you're going to have fees on a true retainer basis, um, you've got to be able to prove that the fee was for availability, that you in fact reserve time to deal with the client's matter. So uh, this can cause you problems on withdrawal when you have a duty to return the unearned fees. So um, that's the end of our formal presentation. And we have a few questions in the time we have left. Uh, let me pull those up. Uh, the first question from um, anonymous attendee, what if the criminal fraudulent conduct is only tangentially and not directly related to the scope of the representation? may an attorney still withdraw? Well, part of it will depend on, on the relationship. You know, if the attorney's services have been sought to uh, commit the, the crime or fraud, uh, yeah, that, that's the grounds for permissive withdrawal. If the client has committed a fraud in an unrelated matter, that might still make the representation, might, might still render the representation unreasonably difficult. Um, again, part of it depends on the nature of what the crime and fraud is, but generally that is not going to compel withdrawal. 
and it may need, it may not <coughs> even be grounds for permissive withdrawal if it's not related to the case. Uh, it's it generally has to bear some relationship with the attorney's representation. Another question: Is it enough to say just say there's been an irreparable breakdown in the attorney-client relationship? Uh, the answer is yes. Under COPRAC, uh, the COPRAC opinion, 2015-192, it is, it, it is sufficient in most circumstances to, to say that. Um, another anonymous question, just confirming, but we're turning a client file to the client. Uh, upon termination of representation, we can remove attorney work product from the client file, correct? No, not correct. Attorney-client work product belongs in the file, uh, and it's got to be returned to the client. And, and although there are some old ethics opinions that say that it need not be returned to the client, that's not the, the, that's not the contemporary view. That's not the view of the State Bar of California. The view of the State Bar is that the client paid for that work product. It's essentially the client's property. Uh, in fact, I, I wrote uh, an ethics opinion on this with uh, Heather Rosing, who some of you may know, uh, 15 years ago, where we concluded that attorney work product had to be provided to the client. No, that is part of the client file. Um, well, this is a good one. What's the difference between a true retainer and a subscription agreement? And what ethical issues does the latter raise? This has been the subject of some controversy. I have a colleague who, who likes subscription agreements. I think a subscription agreement is a true retainer, and such an agreement has to meet all the criteria of a true retainer. Uh, I don't think it's. I don't think there's any difference. A subscription is is sort of trendy and a Quran, uh, but to me, it's exactly the same thing. A subscription means the client is paying you to be available for a period of time. Uh, I mean, we could probably do a whole hour on subscription agreements. Here's a good one. If a case is not settling, the client is out of money on retainer, how close to trial can you withdraw? That is a difficult question to answer. Not too close, but where exactly the line is, I don't know. I mean, it's gonna, it's going to be a very fact specific kind of inquiry. The question is, how prejudicial will your withdrawal be to the client? And that is gonna be a multi-factor determination. So uh, it's, a, it's a question that has to be asked, but the answer may not, the answer may not be easy to come to. It's gonna, in fact, a lot of the consultation I do is talking through these problems with lawyers. So we try to talk through to a resolution as to whether it is too close to withdraw. Some of it may depend on the court, in a state bar discipline matter, I withdrew two weeks before trial. But I mean, that's a very particular kind of matter. Uh, another question, can you withdraw from representation when a client repeatedly insists on you taking unreasonable, unrealistic positions in litigation that are against your advice, which while technically permitted, you're uncomfortable with taking and would tarnish your reputation with the court? Yes, I think that client is making your representation unreasonably difficult. I think you have good grounds for permissive withdrawal. Uh, can you provide the name site for ethics opinions regarding work product being part of the client file? I don't have those, I don't have those um, citations for you. There's an LA County opinion. There's a San Diego County Bar Association opinion. Uh, there's one from San Francisco. Uh, if you did a, a Google search, you would probably be able to find us. Finally, last question. I don't have a good answer. A good software that captures emails. Uh, I use this, I, uh, programs like Smokeball, uh, Clio. They all have the. They all have ways to tag emails and preserve them. Uh, I, I've used Smokeball. It's a very good program. Very expensive program. Uh, the problem with these programs are is that they're not cheap. Although some of them have come down. Uh, uh, Fast case may be a good one. Um, my my practice is at such a small scale that it's not it's not worth a thousand dollars a month for.
for a super robust case management system. But some of you with, with larger practices and employees especially, it, that kind of expenditure may be very a very good and, and providential expenditure. Uh, and we have to the end of our questions. I wanna thank you so much for sharing the last hour with me. It's been a, a real treat and a pleasure. I love talking about this stuff. I hope it's been helpful. And uh, if you need, if you have a question, feel free to contact me. Uh, it's, I'm pretty easy to find. Just do a Google search on David Carr, ethics lawyer, not David Carr, the quarterback, David Carr, the ethics lawyer, not David Carr, the time, New York Times writer, David Carr, the ethics lawyer. And you'll sort through all the David Carrs and you should be able to find me. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I just wanted to pop back in and let everybody know if you would like to hear more ethics talk with David, we're going to have him back next Thursday, January 19th, same time, noon. Go to the San Diego Law Library website on our classes page and you'll find the registration link. So that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Thanks again. <laughs>